All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, July 21st, and we will hear automating land and water data integration for future planning and informed decision making. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the Q&A box. I'll do my best to answer those technical questions. For content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those in the Q&A box as you think of them, and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. If your question is for a particular panelist, it would be helpful if you stated that in your question. So don't raise your hand. We don't have sound for you. Just type your questions in as you think of them, and we'll get to them at the end during uh, the Q&A portion. Coming up on your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2023. Thanks to all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Uh, today, specifically, we are sponsored uh, by the ENRI division. Uh, let's see, Environmental, Natural Resources, and Energy Division, Henry. Uh, and you're going to hear more about one of APA's newer interest groups um, that is also kind of co-sponsoring this with Henry. And you'll hear uh, about the Water Network here in a moment. But we thank you for joining us, for bringing this webcast today, and of course, for being a member. Coming up on your screen is a list of our next few uh, upcoming webcasts. You can register for these and all of our upcoming sessions by visiting our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Today's session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits and one of the sustainability and resilience credits. You can log them by heading over to planning.org log into your My APA account, and from there you can either search by today's title or event number, both of which can be found shortly on our website, again, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Again, so if you're having trouble finding those credits online to record, I know sometimes the search function is kind of funky on the website. You can always search by the exact title or the exact event code, which you can find on our website. If you're on social media, be sure to like us on Facebook. That's where I post any important date or time changes. I post when new sessions are available for you to register for and our upcoming weekly session. I post a reminder of what we have on tap on Friday. We record all of our sessions. We post them onto our YouTube channel. So head over there and just type in planning webcast will pop up along with our well over 400 session recordings all available to you for free. So be sure to subscribe to our channel so you get notified when new sessions have been uploaded. And you can also find direct links to all of our previous webcasts, again, on our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Again, type your questions in that Q&A box. We'll get to those at the end. And I am now going to turn it over to Marianne um, to kick things off for today's session. Marianne. Thank you so much, Christine. And thank you for being willing to host this webinar for us. Um, as Christine mentioned, um, this is a webinar of the American Planning Association's Water and Planning Network. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But this is a, a, a webinar. We have been doing a series of webinars that weren't eligible for uh, CM credits. And now we're very happy uh, to affiliate with the, the Ohio Chapter APA so that we can provide the content that we've been providing for a couple of years now and, and provide AICP uh, CM credits. So thank you very much. Um, as she mentioned, this is a, a webinar on automating land and water data integration for future planning and informed decision making, also known as the Internet of Water. And so we're going to be talking to you all about that today. And But I wanted to just first give you a few uh, seconds of talk about the Water and Planning Network. Um, so if we could go to that slide, that would be great. Um, the Water and Planning Network is, as I mentioned, an interest group of the American Planning Association. It's a free network uh, composed of 
water professionals and land use planning professionals um, that is under the umbrella of APA, but you don't have to be an APA member to join. We do have members from other organizations like the uh, American Water Works Association, American Society of Civil Engineers. Well, our goal was to get water planners uh, in the water resource and water utility planning space together with land use planners to talk about that necessary connection that needs to be made um, in, in going forward in, in planning. Uh, so far, we've got about 550 members that have signed up uh, on our mailing list, and we provide regular newsletters and webinars. I think this is probably our 12th webinar so far, so we've done quite a few. Uh, and all you have to do to join us is just email water at planning.org, and I'll get your email, and I'll add you to the list, and uh, you'll be part of our network. You can also follow us on Twitter, uh, and we also have a LinkedIn account. So, uh, you know, be, please be part of us. We'd be really happy to have you uh, participate in, in our programs. We'd like to feature good work that's being done all around the country. So we, we'd love to have you join us. So at this point, I'm gonna introduce you to Faith Sternlieb of the Lincoln Institute for Land Policy. And she is going to take it away and introduce the team. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Marianne and the Water and Planning Network and Ohio APA and NRA for inviting us to speak um, today on our work, um, automating land and water data integration for future planning and informed decision-making. I'm gonna be um, speaking with my team who has joined me here. Uh, JP Miller is Associate Director for the Center for Geospatial Solutions. And Emily Wiggins is a Senior Analyst uh, with the Center for Geospatial Solutions or CGS. I'm Associate Director for Engagement with the Internet of Water, which is an initiative of CGS. So we are all part of CGS, um, uh, responding, answering to the mothership of the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. I'm located in Phoenix, Arizona, but CGS is uh, largely at large. And so um, my colleagues are on the East Coast. So we welcome everyone from across the country to join us in this journey. Next slide. So just wanted to give you a little bit about what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, we are gonna give you a brief introduction to CGS. We're gonna talk about some of the water challenges that um, we're facing specifically in the Southwest, uh, which is where I am. Uh, we're going to, JP is going to talk about building the water hub that we worked on together with our partners in the Southwest. And um, Emily's gonna cover some lessons learned. Um, and then we'll talk about where we're going from here or we, where we hope to go from here. So next slide. A little bit about the Center for Geospatial Solutions. We largely see our kind of mission in four key focus areas environmental data and modernization, land and water management, sustainable infrastructure development, and data-driven policy making. So we see this project um, as kind of a, a, at the nexus of all four of these focus areas, and you'll see why soon. But um, the Center for Geospatial Solutions really aims at helping organizations on the front lines with some of the most complex challenges, as we all know, Water is one of them, whether you have too much, whether you don't have enough, um, or whether you're looking at data and technology. So that's um, Center for Geospatial Solutions has been with the Lincoln Institute for about two years. Um, and I've been with the Center for Geospatial Solutions with the Internet of Water for about uh, six, seven months now. So I am new with the center, but I've been with the Lincoln Institute for five years, very proudly. Next slide. So we wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, <laughs> some of the news that you might have seen coming out uh, nationwide and probably globally as well about um, Arizona in particular and how we are running out of water, how there is a water crisis on our hands, how there's a water grab, um, how we're, um, we're facing kind of where that um, basically cities are not able to provide water for those communities. 
So we, w this is the news that's coming out right now. And it is true, um, Arizona is dependent on groundwater as, um, although Arizona has a much larger portfolio, including the groundwater in the Colorado River, um, as well as the Gila River and the Salt River. Um, so we, we have a mixed portfolio of both surface water and groundwater. Um, we're gonna be talking about central uh, Arizona, Pinal County in particular, where um, the Arizona Department of Water Resources came out with its groundwater model uh, for Pinal County. Um, they were basically the first groundwater model um, to come out. So Arizona Department of Water Resources, ADWR, has been looking at all, all of the areas across the state, but came out with the Pinal County groundwater model first and showed that it was um, that the groundwater is being significantly over withdrawn. Um, so that model has course assumptions that no one has been able to answer due to insufficient data. And we are tracking water data at a greater, greater level now than ever, um, although we still see um, some disc discrepancies. And we are doing this um, at region to region, um, looking at groundwater and um, better understanding and also that within the larger context of the Colorado River. So despite some of these, um, next slide, despite some of these sensationalist um, articles, granted there's some truth in, in, in a, mo a lot of what you read, but um, I would say it's also sensationalist. We are not actually running out of, out of water. Um, we are looking at how we can grow in a more sustainable and a water smart way. Um, and some of the things, um, some of the decisions that have come out from uh, the governor's office um, is aimed at doing just that. So if you see um, that we're limiting growth and limiting development, um, that is actually true. However, there's a much larger context within which that is happening. And though that is considering now, um, as we have been doing, considering uh, groundwater and water uh, surface water resources since 1980, since the Groundwater Management Act was passed. Um, and now we are looking a little bit more closely on, on how um, growth is happening and how we can grow more sustainably and um, water smart. So there is such a thing um, in the West, as you, you may have heard about uh, basically actual water or wet water versus paper water. Um, this has to do with the overallocation of the Colorado River. Um, so this is largely surface water rights. Um, and we, we, are, we have been in this project investigating um, the difference between um, actual water and paper water. That makes a big difference in the data that we're collecting um, and the data that is representing uh, the water that is available, that is actually being used. So we are linking actual water in this project with aggregating real water um, use at the subdivision level, comparing that to a, the assured water supply which is what subdivisions are permitted to use. And the assured water supply is a rule um, that says that a developer cannot develop unless they have 100 years worth of supply. Um, that's an Arizona rule ground, rule on groundwater. So there's a, there's a vast complexity having to do with um, water rights and whether those water rights are pertain to surface water or whether those rights pertain to groundwater. But all of that is being considered within uh, the, the realm of this project. And if you want to get more information about Colorado River water, um, and that includes water rights, water policy, um, and water decision making across the U.S. West. Uh, this is a story map that the Center for Geospatial Solutions has created with the Babbitt Center for Land and Water Policy, both at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. And you can go here, we're gonna post the link either now or later for you to take a look further into Colorado River water law. So we are not getting into that at this time. I covered uh, the very bare minimum of what that entails. 
So we're going to take you to Pinal County. So where is Pinal County? Um, Pinal County is central-ish Arizona. Um, you can see it's actually, um, here's a, a photo of Casa Grande, which is a community within Pinal County. Um, and this is basically, these are some of our partners that we have worked with. Um, Pinal County has is a strategic, can you, um, next slide, Emily. Um, Pinal County is in a strategic position where you, where it's kind of between Phoenix metro area and Tucson. Um, so it's an extremely high growth area um, on the exurbs of both of these cities. Um, it is also what I like to call ground zero of the Colorado River Basin um, Compact, which is really the area that has taken some of the first cuts of Colorado River water. So basically now the county will be dependent almost fully on groundwater because of the Colorado River cuts. Um, you can see there's a population of about 464,000 uh, compared to, you know, you can compare those populations to similar to Raleigh, North Carolina, or on, on the West, Long Beach, California. And you can see here we have posted the population growth um, and they are projected to continue to grow exponentially. They are a major agricultural producer and Basically, um, now all of the ag in Pinal County will be reliant on, um, on groundwater and other sources of water um, that they will be looking to acquire um, in, with different organizations, different entities across Arizona and the West. Next slide. So one of the, one, many of the challenge, we face many challenges in this project. Um, which is basically um, an attempt to um, combine land use and water data for a few of the entities within Pinal County and Pinal County itself. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges is public perception. As you could see, for example, from the news articles that we um, showcased early on, you can see that, um, th that there is a lot of, you know, a lot of news and whether, again, whether it's false or whether it's sensationalized or whether it's, um, it's true, there is a problem of public perception um, about what's happening in Arizona and what's happening specifically in Pinal County. So, and we had to face that in um, putting in creating the prototype that we did um, as it relates to the water data hub for Pinal County. Trust. We faced um, significant challenges that we were, I would say, safe. I can, I feel like I can safely say that we overcame. Although we are still, um, we still talk about trust on a regular basis, and not only trust between the partners themselves, but trust in in sharing those data with outside entities, like for example, with the Center for Geospatial Solutions. Um, and then trust amongst, um, you know, what kind of data to share, um, how that data are, how those data are going to be shared, and um, what those data are going to be used for. Like, for example, presentations like this. Um, we also are facing challenges in water security. So they, together, we are looking at and investigating the difficulties we're facing with um, a warmer and drier world. Um, and that is true, not only for the US Southwest, but for many areas around the world. We are looking at smart growth and development. So that has been a challenge and that is largely what you have seen in the news, specifically as it relates to Maricopa County, which is where Phoenix is situated and um, Pinal County, which is what we're talking about, as well as Pima County, which is where Tucson is situated. And then data, of course. Where are the data? What data are important? How are those data being represented? Are they accessible? Are they fair? Are they interoperable? Are they reusable? So these were all challenges that we faced as we um, kind of dove into this project. 
The project um, is largely a public-private partnership. And so you may wonder, well, what's the private, a part of the public-private partnership? Well, we were able to partner with a private water company called Arizona Water Company that serves um, Casa Grande, which is a community in Pinal County, and other communities in Pinal County and across the state. And so we, um, we partnered with the municipalities, with this private utility, with the University of Arizona Water Resources Research Center, and of course ourselves, we are a nonprofit operating foundation. Um, and you can see here at Lincoln Institute, um, the Internet of Water Coalition, Geospatial Center for Geospatial Solutions and the Babbitt Center were all involved. So Lincoln had a number of entities involved in this project. We all had different roles and sometimes overlapping roles. Um, we of course depended on our the municipalities and the utility for water data and land use data. Um, we, we depended on Arizona Water Company as a partial funder. They would match to our dollars and local convener. In fact, um, they weren't the only funder. We were also funded by Pinal County and also by Casa Grande. So everybody had a stake in this project um, financially and were committed, um, really committed uh, throughout the, the years, three years, four years that we uh, started this project. We depended on the university, the Water Resources Research Center, um, for stakeholder engagement, and they served as a project convener. And we ourselves at Lincoln Institute, we served a number of different roles, data technologists, project management, and uh, funders. Uh, so we also um, allocated some funding and to support the project. Um, and one thing I want to say about everyone, um, every single one of, our, of the partners contributed to the development and the success of this project. Um, it is not finished by any means, but I would say that, um, again, the commitment and dedication and interest um, with from every single one of our partners was unparamount. And I would also say that they um, all contributed to the thought leadership and partnership that we, we had throughout the duration of the project and continue to have. Um, here, I am going to um, pass it over to JP um, to talk about the Pinal County Water Data Hub prototype and the project and the data. Thanks, JP. Yeah, great. Thanks, Faith. Thanks for that uh, introduction and, and background there. Um, so I'm going to start uh, by talking a lot about what we actually did in this project. Um, and so to start with that, we have to talk about what I term kind of the data information chain. And so what do, what do we mean by that? And really, it's kind of a continuum of what you do with data. Um, and there's lots of different activities typically associated with that when you're working with it. Um, and that goes from uh, at the start, curating data and discovering it, to doing actual analysis, to drive insights. Um, and creating visualizations that help communicate that, um, and then ultimately using that data to make decisions. Um, and so for context, what are, you know, to, to reframe here, what are we talking about? We, the major innovation in this project really is linking actual water usage data. So what every household um, in these communities is actually using, and not just households, uh, in, industrial ones, uh, commercial businesses, taking that actual water data and comparing it to what is permitted, right? Um, which is a much at a much coarser level, typically at a subdivision level. And so that's what everyone is assuming people are using for water. Um, but what we're doing is getting at that really granular level and looking and seeing how much water is actually being used here. Um, and that's something that has not really been done uh, before. And so I think that's a key point to make is we're, we're linking that um, and, and that's a big part of where the innovation is here. Um, okay, so next slide. Um, so what is data curation? What were we doing with this? So one of the first types of data that we needed to curate was water data. Um, and so we, one of the first ones is that geocoded water delivery data. 
uh, aka what we're calling real water, so what people are actually using. Um, Geocoded is really just a fancy way of saying, let's take 123 Main Street and actually put a lat long location to it, and so making it spatial. Um, the assured water supply certificates are what we term kind of paper water, and so that's what's permitted, that's the regulatory amount. Um, it's not necessarily reflecting what is actually being used. Um, and assured water supply certificates for those not familiar with Arizona uh, laws and regulation, um, there, you have to be, as Faith mentioned, be permitted uh, to have enough water to use for 100 years. Um, and so that's what that certificate uh, is assuring. Um, we also were able to gather these groundwater replenishment district memberships um, by subdivision. Um, so we can link that as well. Um, okay, next slide. And so let's take a look at some of this. Um, so this is uh, the planning area for Casa Grande and what was essentially our project area for this prototype. Um, and this is a essentially a portion of Pinal County, which we had showed earlier. Pinal County is really large. This is a portion of that. Um, and what, the area that we're looking at here, there's a lot of overlapping entities that have responsibility here. So one of which is Pinal County, another one is the city of Casa Grande. Um, and then additionally, we have the Arizona Water Company, which is the water utility, providing service to some of these locations. So um, in this effort, we're trying to break down some of those traditional data silos that commonly exist. Um, and so this is the area that we are interested in. Uh, next slide. And what we see here is the assured water supply determinations um, that exist. So this is essentially the paper water, right? And this is the level of coarseness we're talking about, right? We have relatively large polygons that cover uh, a large area determining how much water is allowed to be used there. Um, and what we did with that geocoded water, which we're not showing here, um, and that's by choice um, because it's sensitive data that our partners have provided us. Um, and that's not something that we would share publicly. Um, that's a key point here in building trust is that um, people only have to make available the data that they feel comfortable with and want to, and that's all that will be shown. And that's a principle um, that we follow closely at CGS and with the Internet of Water. Um, but what you can see here is this is right now, uh, prior to this project and what is being used across Arizona, how we're tracking is there enough water, right? And, and there's actually like a pretty coarse level going on here. Um, okay, next slide. So what we have to do is link that water data um, to land and planning data. Um, and so there's lots of data that's involved with that. Um, we have parcel data, we have subdivision data. Um, it's a key point, we take that actual water usage data and first we link it to the parcels and then we aggregate it to the subdivision level. So every parcel within the subdivision. Um, and the reason for that is our partners had agreed that at the subdivision level, that was a level of anonymity that everyone was comfortable with making public. Um, and so that was like kind of the key level that everyone felt was appropriate um, and they had trust in, but we are actually measuring it at a much more granular level than that. Um, also, we had the preliminary plats from the city. So that's essentially what potentially could be developed. And additionally, we had the final plat, so that's what's actually been developed. And lastly, we additionally have the final occupancy inspections. Um, and so that enables us to tell what has been built and what has not actually been built. So we can measure, not quite in real time, but close to it. Okay, next slide. So let's take a look at what these look like. Um, so we have parcel data, um, which, I, you know, there is a, enormous amount of parcels within um, just this planning area. Uh, next slide. Um, and we aggregate those to some of these different established subdivisions, which are shown here in green. Uh, they kind of have light gray boundaries to them, but that's the actual subdivisions within the area we're talking about here. Next slide. This is the preliminary plats uh, for the city of Casa Grande. So this is all potential development that uh, may have occurred or may not have occurred or may occur in the future. And then additionally, we have final plats, next slide, uh, which have actually occurred. And uh, we have brought these essentially uh, all into one place. Um, and so within um, 
each of these different geographies, one of the things that we can do is figure out, okay, how built out are these? What is our level of completion? So next slide. Um, so to do that, we brought in these finalized building permit inspections. And what you can see here is uh, every red dot corresponds with a um, uh, owner, owner or renter occupied unit. So it has actually come online. Um, you can see a few of, uh, in the imagery, you can see that there are some units that have been completed, but have not been actually occupied yet. Um, so this gives us an idea of how many people are actually um, in the, uh, how many people are actually uh, have moved into these units and what that level of completion is like. Next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, how do we gather and store all this information? So what we used was ArcGIS Online. Some of you may be familiar with this, some of you may not, um, but essentially it's a software as a service uh, platform available online where everybody can kind of collect and share their data in one central location that everybody can access. And we can also establish different uh, permission levels so that some users can see certain things that other users can see uh, other parts of it. If you're familiar with SharePoint, uh, the permissions are like pretty similar to that. Um, but essentially, we are able to uh, collect a lot of that information and store it in one central location where everyone can work with it and help you kind of break down those traditional silos that exist. Next slide. Um, so in that, circling back to that data continuum that I talked about, the next step really is data discovery. So, you know, we've curated, we've gotten some of this data in place, but there's additional data that we know that we need to have to do what we need to do. So we have to find it and discover it. Um, and that exists for both water data and for that land and planning data. Um, this is where we needed to get some additional information from ADWR. Um, and additionally, what we needed to do was for that real water data, one thing that's really key is um, what is it being used for? And by that, we mean, is it being used for agriculture? Is it being used for industry? Is it being used for commercial spaces, residential communities, open space? Um, and so really drilling down into the level of data that we're talking about. On the land use and planning side, um, we also needed a lot of the different administrative boundaries that exist, uh, planning boundaries, zoning, uh, planned area developments, and also really importantly to tag all these subdivisions by what year, when they were created, what assured water supply regulatory phase was there. Because some of these um, were built before current rules and laws were in place versus some of them were built with these laws in place. And that's a very important piece of information that we need to know. Uh, next slide. So how did we do this? How did we discover this data? How did we start working with everyone? Well, we had a bunch of workshops and uh, working meetings to try to lay this out. And so um, I'm gonna show a number of diagrams here. You don't need to go into detail and try to understand all of them. Um, I will give you kind of the key takeaway points from them. Um, but specifically with this one, what we did was for each of the communities that we were looking at working with, we figured out, okay, what is the input data that they have? What format is it in? How frequently is that updated? And is there any data sensitivity associated with that? And so we mapped that out and then we figured out, okay, then what are we gonna do with that to make all of this data integrate with each other? Um, and so that's kind of what the right portion of that diagram is, but um, it's not important for this right now. Okay, next slide. So, we mapped out all the different data types that we needed. And we really um, you know, noticed the complexity of the planning data in particular, especially because the two communities that we were working with, Pinal County and the city of Casa Grande, um, do planning in a little bit different way. Just, you know, if you think of the traditional example of uh, you know, how does a bill become a law? It's kind of similar here. How does a parcel actually become a parcel in these different communities? Um, it's quite different. And so we had to map out that process. Um, and that was really important for us to understand because we want to be able to track in somewhat real time as things are developing, how much water is actually being used. Um, we also consciously made the decision to take uh, that water, that real water data and aggregate it to a level that is more anonymous that the partners are comfortable with. So one parcel could theoretically have multiple water meters. Think of a multifamily residence. Um, so the first step is aggregating at that parcel, 
we then aggregate at the subdivision level. Um, and so there's you know a couple of layers of abstraction here that we're doing, but that's also that subdivision level is currently the only level that water is really being monitored at from a regulatory perspective, as opposed to the actual water usage. So as I mentioned, we've kind of drilled down in that. Um, next slide. And we have to take that and integrate the water and planning data. And so what we have along the top here is basically the process of how water data uh, gets acquired by the utility. So they have uh, folks actually go out in the field and read water meters, um, and they record that, and then they bring it back and download that information into a physical server, which they query and geocode. And geocode is just, as I mentioned before, adding all that long to it. Um, that's stored in a database. And we have taken that um, and we've integrated that with this land use data. Um, and what we can see in this middle row here is basically the process of how these, what they term a mother parcel gets developed. And so you can imagine a large rectangle slowly over time actually being developed. Um, and you know it, it's usually not just developed all at once. There's multiple phases that occur. Um, they can be for different types of development. Um, they can be different levels of density. Um, and so we had to map this to that. Uh, next slide. So this brings us to the next step of this data continuum, and that's really data analysis and insights. And the first step here is to take a step back and think, okay, what questions are we really trying to solve here? Um, and I think there's several. So you know, the first is how much water do we have? How much water do we use? What's left over? And if we project what is currently in the pipeline to be built out, what do those scenarios look like? Um, next slide. Additionally, in what information are we gonna need for that? Um, so we're gonna need to know how much water each subdivision is using, how built out is each subdivision? And then based on how much water a partially built out subdivision is using, how much water will it need when it's fully built out? And from that, we can develop a water demand factor. And then we can take that analysis a step further and say, okay, if all existing and planned subdivisions were built out, how much water would they use? And is any water left over? Have we used too much water? Next slide. So the way that we did this was we tried to think about what are the different pieces and axes of information that we need to do this. So the first is land use. Next slide. The second is water. Next slide. And the third is really time. And so these are the three dimensions to our data that we're trying to analyze because we have water data, we have land use and planning data. And then we also need to view that through the time dimension. Um, so that's the complexity really of the data that we're working with here. Okay, next slide. And so what we did is we mapped out the different categories of that data, its source, um, identify the specific layers associated with it, and then identify the actions and outcomes um, that we would like to achieve, as well as how we would like folks to be able to interact with that data. And that's what the filter column is there. And that's the level of detail that we want to go into with this. So within the subdivisions, there's different types of subdivisions. Um, and within the water data itself, there's different categories of actual water use that we'd like to investigate. Next slide. So putting it all together, how do we do this? We go back to that ArcGIS Online collaboration group that I demonstrated there. And what we do is we have our different partners upload their information to that common repository. And within that, what we do is we actually have what are called um, notebooks. Um, they're written in the Python language and they use Jupyter to automate uh, the data transformation that needs to take place to link this. Um, and so that enables us to update this regularly over time based on the level, the frequency of the underlying data itself. Um, so let's take a look at what that looks like. Um, this is what one of those notebooks looks like itself. Um, and so uh, we can go ahead and schedule these. So this is the, an ability you have in ArcGIS Online. Um, you can schedule them to run at whatever cadence you want. We can do every 15 minutes. Obviously our data doesn't need that level of frequency, um, but within this, we can document exactly what we're doing. So it's very transparent how we're arriving at all of this. 
and we can transform and clean and actually publish this data so that it's in the format that we need to do to do this type of analysis. Okay, next slide. Um, so now we get to the fun part, which is actually visualizing this analysis. And um, what we wanted to think through here is how can we clearly provide this critical information to those who need it? Um, and so next slide. These are those subdivisions that I mentioned that have certificates of assured water supply. Um, so we know how much water they are permitted to use. Um, but what we'd really like to know is how much water are they actually using compared to how much water are they permitted to use? Um, so one way we could do that is with a special type of mapping called bivariate mapping. Next slide. Um, and next slide one more time. Um, and bivariate mapping is really just a fancy way of saying looking at two things at the same time. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're looking at real water use versus permitted water use. Um, and so we have this little diamond here, which I will walk us through how to understand what we're looking at. Um, so next slide. So on this diamond, um, this kind of like tan color means that it is an area that has low paper water, so low permitted actual amount of water, and it's also using a low amount of water, right? Um, so that's kind of this left-hand part of the diamond. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> if we move down the diamond, we go in a different dimension, and that's where there's a low amount of um, water allowed, uh, permitted to be used, but a high amount of actual water being used. So this would indicate a location where water is actually being overused compared to what it is supposed to be, which is obviously problematic. Alternatively, um, if we go up towards the orange here, what we see is an area that has a high amount of water allocated to it that it is permitted to use, but it is actually using a low amount of water. Um, and what we can see is there's actually a lot of orange on the map here. Um, and then additionally, if you move over to the right um, you, in the color gradient, um, that would indicate in this kind of like gray color, this dark gray, um, that there's a high permitted amount of water allowed to be used and all of that, and that water is also highly actually being used. And so what we've done here with the innovation is very quickly, we can look at these subdivisions and see which of them um, are using either more water than they're supposed to be using or have a lot more water allocated to them that they can in fact actually use. Um, and so this enables us to link the paper and real water together um, and be able to actually view that. And so kind of these corners of the diamond as you move to them tell you different things because there's a continuum um, in a relationship between this kind of paper and real water. How much water is actually being used versus what are they allowed and permitted to be used. Um, and what we can see here is, frankly, there's a lot of places that they um, have not have not been developed, but have that certificate of assured water supply associated with it. Um, and what we can know then is we we have some confidence that we can in fact actually develop in these locations um, because we know that um, you know there there is a lot of water left to be used here, um, and we can do that in a smart way and track what we are actually using. Um, in those locations and project what can we actually build out. Okay, next slide. Um, so this gets us to making decisions here. Um, so this is uh, what we're looking at is the same subdivisions and how much water they're actually using. And we can see which subdivisions are using a large amount of water and which ones are not. Um, we have the ability to drill down actually to the parcel level, but it was a conscious choice by the data providers. Um, that that was a level of detail we were uncomfortable going to. So that's why we actually abstracted it to this subdivision level. Next slide. Um, we also can use that in a dashboard to track the water data and see how much um, of the assured water supply that we have in this location is actually being consumed and used versus how much is available still to be used um, based on uh, actual uh, build out scenarios. Um, so as you can see, we really got to the point where we could uh, view and plan with a greater level of detail than had been able to be done in the past. 
Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Emily, to talk about some of the best practices we, we uh, discovered during this process. Thanks, JP. <laughs> So one of the things that we were able to help all of the project partners figure out is what pieces of data were missing that they needed. We collected so much data from so many different sources in our ArcGIS online group that we were able to see gaps in things that maybe weren't digitized yet, in data that was locked up in paper files in a filing cabinet somewhere. So we were able to help them identify what data was missing that they needed to help answer some of these questions. In line with that, the modernization of some of these data systems, we've been working with the partners to help script some of these processes, as JP showed, to help make everyone's lives easier and more efficient. Um, some of these things are done more manually than they have to be, and so it's been great to make everyone's lives easier to script some of these things out. So it's um, saving time and energy and money. Uh, also trying to reduce the learning curve is one of the things that we've really been conscious about. ArcGIS Online is, in my opinion, very user-friendly, but I'm an, a GIS user on my day-to-day -day job. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that we were meeting people where they were at and taking the time with plenty of meetings to make sure everyone was comfortable and familiar with where their data was going. As my colleagues have said, you know, making sure no personal identifiable information was shared, making sure that people understood what we had um, so everyone felt included and understood where their data was going. On a more uh, particular basis, when you are working with a group of folks from a variety of different sources, we wanted to make sure that the naming conventions were as standardized as they could be. Um, you know, it's very easy. I'm sure everyone can relate to calling files something like final version V5, final version V6. Um, you know, trying to make sure things are standardized so, you know, you're looking at apples to apples when you're all using this data that's being shared in this ArcGIS online group for the hub. Um, also, one thing that makes the end users' lives really easier is making sure things are accurately documented, being very explicit about the information that's contained in it, being very explicit about which which attribute field should be used, which attribute field should be symbolized on the map, how often data sets can be anticipated for being updated, uh, who the person in charge is, an email, contact information, phone, um, if people leave jobs, which happens, you know, who the next best person to contact is, all of those things because it really is a group and team effort to get all of these different sources of data from a variety of different places up in here so the whole system can work together effectively. So those were just some of the things that we uh, tried to keep in mind, along with ultimately compiling a best practices document that moving forward, um, we can hopefully adopt as a group to make sure that everyone's holding each other accountable. If someone uploads a file with an incorrect name, with a typo, with a final version two, version three, you know, we want to correct that so this thing can last into the future and be a clear and concise resource for the future to come. So I'll pass it back to my colleagues now. Thanks, Emily. So what are we learning? Oh, so much. Um, one of the key things that, you know, this may, this may to anyone, I, outsiders, this project look like a data project, but I would actually argue this is a people project. <laughs> this um, required um, working at the local level. It required years um, of development, um, relationship development and um, stakeholder engagement to really be able to get the get everyone at a place where we could start sharing data. So I would say, so for example, um, that stakeholder engagement relationship development period was maybe two, two and a half of the of the three or four years that we've been working on this, whereas the data sharing happened just within the last few months. Um, and so that speaks volumes to the importance of building trust at a local level uh, that 
we actually have partners on the ground at the local level and that we are there also, um, dependent also on our internal team. So we realized um, we, were, we were very fortunate um, that we have such a skillful team at the Center for Geospatial Solutions. And when we saw that it was going to take um, more time and effort and um, more skills than what we had, at least the three of us um, that are speaking today to you, that we turned to our colleagues at the Center for Geospatial Solution and they came through um, with flying colors to help us build out the um, data hub prototype. And finally, I would say, we have learned uh, what it takes to build a hub, a data hub, a water data hub like this um, for regions, for communities and communities who are trying to work together, who want to work together, um, that we found that being a neutral entity um, where we were largely working with data, but needed to make sure that our partners trusted us, that we were uh, as effective as we could be. And I wanna pass it, JP, do you have anything to add to that? Unmuting myself here, sorry. Um, you know, as I think Faith covered a lot of really good points there, but you know, the big one was really building trust between these different partners. I cannot emphasize how important that was. And I think it's what's really set this project up for success is that um, that took time to build. You know, trust is earned, not given in a lot of times. And so really there was an enormous amount of work up front to get folks involved. And I think they're really excited about it now because um, now that they do trust this and they see what they can do when they do trust each other and have the correct level to, of ability to share that information with one another, um, you know, it can really revolutionize how they do planning. Um, tracking that information down for each step of the process is not trivial. Um, and frankly, having a single location where you can access all the information you need um, is extremely helpful. Um, and so I just think we can't emphasize how important it is to earn that trust upfront and get buy-in from all the different stakeholders involved. And I guess I will add, and Emily, you can keep this here um, on this slide, but I, I will add that um, we hope that the partners continue to trust us. So we are presenting this. Um, I would not say that we're presenting this on their behalf, um, but we are presenting this as a partner in the project. Um, because we feel like this has a lot of value for communities, whether in the U.S. Southwest or community, communities in the Pacific Northwest and the Northeast um, for Ohio um, facing, you know, different issues with water um, and land use, for example, with flooding um, and other uh, impacts that we're seeing from climate change. So, I will say that um, we can, um, we feel confident that we can um, work with other communities on, you know, whatever issues that they're facing um, to work with them and their, their data to help them get organized and automated. Um, so this project has come a long way. We started in 2019 uh, with a concept development. Um, I was working very closely with the University of Arizona Water Resources Research Center. Um, and we, we were actually, this even started before then, um, working with uh, the city of Casa Grande through a Babbitt Center for Land and Water Policy Program called Growing Water Smart, where we bring um, decision makers who are working in land use and water management together from a, a local municipality um, just to get them talking about land and water and how to integrate um, land and water and what and how to address those uh, issues that they're having with their land and water. And so Casa Grande was one of those communities. They came and well, that's when we started working with Casa Grande. And I think from that project, um, they saw the value of the land and water integration. And um, we were able to further and continue to work with them on a demand management program that they rolled out as well as an entire uh, water conservation educational campaign 
that stemmed also from the Growing Water Smart program um, that they rolled out in their community in Arizona. Water Company has actually taken that air education water uh, conservation campaign to the other communities that they serve. Um, and so in phase three, we, um, we worked long and hard on a multi-party um, MOU. So that was between all of the partners I mentioned before, um, the two municipalities, Canal County, Casa Grande, Arizona Water Company, the University of Arizona Water Resources Research Center, and Lincoln Institute. Um, and then and once we finalized that MOU, and that was all during COVID, so it was particularly challenging, um, we were able to build out um, the, the prototype that we presented to you here. Phase four um, and beyond, we really hope to continue to work with the communities in Pinal County um, and to serve their needs um, and continue this work on the prototype. I, I, like I said, it is not finished by any means. We have only just gotten started. And um, with this prototype though, we know we will be able to help other communities um, work on, those, on their challenges, land and water or just land or just water with a similar um, type of system in terms of mod modernizing their water, their water data systems and their land use data systems, um, and um, perhaps even apply it to a basin scale. Um, so really building that out. Next slide. So we are in a new and different time. We are um, in a in a time and place where we can no longer depend on our historical data. Um, new things and new systems are emerging, um, all you know, setting records as we are right now, setting heat records, especially in the US South, Southwest, but also um, records, flooding records in the Northeast. Um, we can no longer rely and depend on those historical data. We have to begin um, organizing and monitoring and tracking our current data um, for today, now, for tomorrow. And this, these, this prototype is a way, is one of probably many ways in which um, we can do that. We can start thinking about and what well, we already have started thinking about, but actually preparing and planning um, for the future with with today's data, not yesterday's data. And JP, I wanted to hand it over to you in case you had some more wisdom. To yeah, my, what I would close saying is just, you know, we're, we're in a different era. I think many of us can recognize that. And that means that we can't necessarily rely on some of the processes and ways of planning or doing business that we have in the past. And I think what we've put together is one way um, that, you know, we could get away with some of this coarser planning in the past because there was plenty of water to go around. Um, now we actually need to track that with a much greater uh, degree of fidelity. Um, and I think that is key, is that we have to rethink the way we do a lot of things. Um, and so things that we've relied on in the past are not necessarily going to be able to be relied upon in the future for the conditions that we know that we are going to be facing. Next slide, Emily. And with that, we want to thank all of you for participating in the webinar. We especially want to thank our hosts um, for inviting us to present here. We uh, will open it up to questions, I believe, through Christine. Um, we are available and accessible um, through these links, but also um, you can email us directly and maybe we can share our email addresses in the chat. But um, thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, let's dive in a little bit. Um, first question is, what was the price tag on this? Well, the price tag actually was a lot greater than uh, the funds that we raised. Um, so in the very beginning, we, you know, we planned that this would be a one-year project. Um, and the MOU took much, much longer than we anticipated because each of the communities needed to go to their councils to get it approved. 
Um, in fact, there was one community that did not get it approved, um, but we and we didn't include um, their data, but they have been uh, participating in our meetings and staying very close um, to the work that we're doing and are, are, I think are interested in getting involved. So that's <laughs> getting around to answering the question. Um, we, we started this out, it was matching dollars between the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy and Arizona Water Company and Pinal County and Casa Grande. Um, and so total, we, um, we, the total cost of this one year project that we thought was gonna be one year was 60,000. Um, like I said, it, it's taken a lot um, more than that, both from the University of Arizona Water Resources Research Center um, and also on behalf of Lincoln Institute. And then, um, and of course the time and effort from the communities and the utilities. So, um, 60,000 does not represent at all the amount of work and time and energy that has gone on into this. Thank you. Um, next question is, and I know we talked, you, you mentioned, several of you had mentioned about, you know, how this could really impact the future of how we plan and how we do things. Uh, this question is, what, how, how might this tracking really change water policy. And I guess I would say to that, um, what can we say to our decision makers, our electeds, um, to start more conversations about this, about the importance of tracking and uh, investing in this for the future of our communities? JP? Yeah, sure. I think that's a great question. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of ways that it could change policy, frankly. Um, and a lot of that is still to be determined. What we've really done is um, shine a light on this, right? These are things that people weren't really able to tell. And the fun thing about when you visualize this is suddenly you have a lot more questions than what you started with. Um, and I think a lot of those questions are where this is headed with some of the water policy. Um, what I would say are things that I can imagine are, you know, tracking actual water use versus model like we could have much better models first of all we could have a much better idea in these models of how much water we are actually using and these different types of development are going to consume um, and so i think as far as water policy goes there's a lot of implications for it just within the state of arizona alone um, for their assured water supply um, uh, certificates and program i think that it can inform that to a much greater degree than has been possible traditionally. And I guess I would just add um, specific to, um, you know, this project in this particular location of the country, um, and I guess even, you know, more expansive than this, even than just Arizona or Pinal County, I would say that the U.S. West in general, I think we can grow more, we can be more smart about our growth. So I think this is the way to do it. Um, and this, these are the data that we need in order to make those decisions about water smart growth. Um, this is a good question. So do you think implementing programs like this is the answer to solving the water crisis? Let's just say in the West, in the Southwest, I, I'm going to come out right away and say no. I think it is a tool in our toolkit. And I think it's a very important tool in our toolkit. But there are many problems and many challenges. And this helps address just one of them. Um, but I think there are things in what we did that can be helpful just in the overall process itself of building trust, um, breaking down some of the silos of data and information that exist out there those parts of it which are kind of more macro to this project really are key to solving this and i'll take a just a little bit different perspective and say that well i, I mean i agree with you jp that um it's not the only end all be all um answer or response um that is needed however i will say that um if if we don't share our data 
if we don't have a common understanding of how much water we're using and where that water is going and who's using that water, we cannot even begin to start to answer any of those questions. So this is like foundational is what I see. It maybe is it like a, a silver bullet? No, but foundational to all kinds of decision-making um, and not just about um, water use. Like for example, um, the more fields that are fallowed, the more dust we have in, in, our, in our atmosphere, the more air quality uh, problems we will have, the more of a public health problem we will have. And so there, there's compounding issues to the, to the water, to our water challenges. And this is, this is the, just the very first step in, in thinking about those issues. And Faith, um, this leads me then to my to my next question, what you just said, but not opening up Pandora's box here, because there has to be a point, I guess, when you're looking at the data, like you got to stop somewhere, right? And so there's a couple questions in here, and I too am thinking through this as a planner. I'm thinking, okay, well, when you're talking about, you know, metrics, things that you're measuring, are you talking about like density? Are you talking about, I don't know, tree canopy? Are you talking about uh, how much commercial versus residential, um, those sort of things, low impact, like are there rules about low impact development in the community or, you know, how much surface area you have and where that water might go? Like, that's the kind of stuff that my brain does. Um, and if you could speak a little bit to whether or not those like really minute details were taken into account and or should they in the future? Um, absolutely. I would say all of the above and then some, <laughs> but maybe not all of them at the same time in the same place. So every community is going there. Each community is going to have to figure out um, kind of the solutions that will work for them and the challenges that they're facing. And so it is a toolbox kind of what, uh, going back to what JP said, this is a tool in the toolbox, along with all of those um, kind of um, it, like interventions that you mentioned, Christine, those are all tools. And so a community, you know, really has to assess where they are, where they wanna be in the future and how they wanna get there and what does that look like? And so I think, all of those interventions are important. We can't leave any one of them behind, um, but we also don't have to implement every single one of them in each and every community. Yeah, I think I, I would add on, I think, you know, the don't let perfect be the enemy of good is, is very important in situations like this. We spent a lot of time discussing upfront a lot of the questions you mentioned, Christine, in terms of what is the scope of this project and what can we actually achieve right now? And we can keep building onto that. And I think um, I noticed Carl's question there in the chat, which I think is a good one. And that's one of those things that we absolutely would like to look at, um, you know, is some of the impacts of zoning or density. Um, what are the trends? What are we seeing in that? Um, being able to do that type of analysis is now possible, but we had to do some of the foundational work to even get to this point. And really what we're showing here is that initial foundational work. Um, so. And um, what about, this is a good question. So how do you adjust for things like water main leaks or um, misreading of meters or, you know, breakdown of meters and estimates versus actuals and all of sort of like that area of I don't know. I don't even know what you would call yeah, it, but not yeah, not hundred percent. You know, sure. uncertainty. I think that there's That's uncertainty the in data, right? Um, and and we have to. Well, this is much more accurate, and we can measure things with in with at a much more granular level than we have in the past. That doesn't mean it's perfect. Um, and I think that one of the things is with data available like this, we can spot some of that, right? Like if you notice some of these discrepancies, they're easier to catch now that we have the ability to view and review that data. Um, so I think that's that's one. The second is, I will say it is a limitation of this that our real water is based on the water 
meters being read, right? So leaks and stuff like that would not be necessarily captured in it. However, um, there is the ability for the utility to compare what their meters are showing versus what they're actually using. And you can take that delta and figure out what is leaking. Um, but that was not something that we were able to capture in this, and certainly a limitation. Um, I also saw questions about uh, water reuse. Um, yeah, that I was going to ask that next. That the <laughs> partners have discussed, and I think that's kind of maybe there, there's a lot of ways that this project can expand. One of them is in geographic scope, right? So bringing in other partners, other areas. Another one is in types of analysis and level of detail, and uh, water reuse is one of those that is very much on our radar. And actually, um, Arizona in general, and as in particular, Arizona Water Company, um, they they work and are you know huge proponents of um, wastewater reuse, um, recharge, because of the communities and where they serve those communities. And so it's very much a part of their portfolio. Um, I can't speak to how much. Um, I'm sure that they have some of that information online. Okay. Um, next one. Examples of how local partners are using or will be using the data. Yeah, I think that's a great one. Uh, one example would be for the utility itself. Um, you know, it has been considerable effort for them to, in the past, collect the information they need to get to the point where they feel comfortable installing water meters um, or tracking within these subdivisions, okay, I know that we put meters in there, but how built out is that subdivision? Um, they can see that now. Um, and so it really informs them on that. Um, there's also a desire to uh, put some of this more public facing, um, which, which hasn't occurred yet, but I think there's a desire there to add some transparency to uh, you know, what is possible in terms of community development um, and for folks to be able to understand uh, what what is possible in that realm, and so it would be available to uh, folks in those municipalities. Um, um, these are a couple that I can think of offhand. Speaking of transparency and public facing, mm -hmm. um, is the MOU that was developed like between what would it, whatever it would be like the county and the. Lincoln Land Institute or whoever the entities were that officially partnered, uh, is that MOU available um, for others to see? Uh, that's a great question. I um, I wouldn't um, be comfortable sharing that particular MOU unless, of course, we got um, permission from all of our partners who signed the MOU. But what we could do, and this is the first time I've thought of it, is to create a template based on that. Um, so really generalize it, anonymize it, and um, and make it accessible um, so people can see the kind of the components and elements that went into it right. um, and the thinking behind it um, and you know just kind of what might be required. It's certainly not uh, maybe the end all be all for all communities. They would probably have to you know really uh, personalize it to their communities, right. but. That would be really that would be a really okay. cool thing to do yeah. for an outcome for this project. Also, thank you for um, the idea. <laughs> and who who was the official lead for this project? Um, I guess I would say um, it was conceptualized between uh, myself, um, my colleague at the University of Arizona Water Resources Research Center. Her name is Ashley Hullinger. And I would say um, the lead from the Arizona Water Company, um, Terry Sue Rossi. Um, and next, did you consider other automation solutions such as FME? And I, I will admit, I don't know what FME is. I assume it's some kind of like data collection and yeah. manipul you know, manipulating sure. type yeah, of programming. FME, FME can be a great solution. Um, the reason that we chose to go with the ArcGIS Online environment and schedule Python notebooks was one, all of our partners are already using ArcGIS um, and have as your licenses, use it commonly. Um, and so it was a convenient location for everyone to start using. And they all had staff that were already trained and able to use that. And so it really met the needs of our partners best. 
I'll also just add that the in terms of the scheduling of the notebooks, um, the nice thing with that from a technical perspective for those of you who are um, GIS proficient on the call is that it's really easy to document them. And uh, it's not just like code that's there and people are like, what is going on in this? Like it's, it's very well documented and structured. And so that makes it one, transparent, two, repeatable, and three, maintainable. Um, and so additionally, those notebooks can actually run in the cloud. So there's no need to like configure servers or systems architecture. Um, and so really it was a simple solution to deliver what we needed. And at some point, will this data, again, talking about the transparency and you know the public facing, will it become like open source? Is that something that's possible or that would even make sense, you know, moving forward and kind of opening, you know, this up to others? That is really in the hands of the partners, um, okay. the decision, uh, what, what they want to make accessible and transparent and what they want to keep um, proprietary. So, um, and we, we respect that. That is a part of you know, collecting and managing um, and maintaining data. Um, we, of course, are proponents of open data, but there are many cases in which data just cannot be shared. Um, but what can, what, you know, how can we, um, I guess, manipulate those data so that they, we can at least share lessons learned or share mm -hmm. um, or aggregate the data so that uh, there's no, you know, personal identifying information and um, what are the ways in which we can work with those data um, that we still get information about the resource out so that it, you know, at least um, we can have a common and shared understanding. If I can add something to that, um, one of the Internet of Water principles is fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, repeatable, I believe is the R. Mm -hmm. uh, and so part of that is using open source. But as folks in the GIS community know, Esri is the, the name in the game, basically. And many people are more savvy with the Esri system. It does dovetail nicely with a lot of open source solutions. So it's not necessarily a one size fits all, but certainly if we could encourage open source, we're all for that as well. And I'll add one final point, and that's just, it doesn't have to be a binary decision. It doesn't have to be open or closed. I think that what we can do is find a level that folks are comfortable with where we can't have it be open. Um, and I think that uh, we certainly encourage that. There's enormous, enormous benefits to it, um, oftentimes in ways that partners initially can't uh, foresee, um, but can absolutely occur. And I think incrementally, as we build trust and release that, people see the value in it. Um, so our hope is certainly to have as much of this open to others as possible. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, it's not appropriate necessarily to have some personally identifiable information in there or, or very sensitive material. And we absolutely respect that as well. Yeah. And one more point to that is such an important question and issue. And it's something we deal with in all kind of all of our projects is that we are working at multiple scales. So not just at the local or regional scale, but at the state and federal scale. And we have helped, for example, the state of Texas. Um, they just launched their Texas Water Data Hub. We have helped New Mexico with their open water data hub, um, California. We are working uh, with USGS and Bureau of Reclamation to encourage and um, help them increase the interoperability of their data. And these are these are all starting points, I'd say. <laughs> you know, they we're we're starting, you know, to work with the federal government in, in, in fair data. We're mm -hmm. working with the state in fair data. And before you know it, um, we hope that the state and federal data will be interoperable. So that when you, for example, Google any any point, you will be able to get all of the water data um, from that information, you know, from from that for that place. So that is kind of the dream here. That's what we're working towards. <laughs> um, in the interim, I'm going to ask the question that everyone's thinking, but 
no one is typing. Um, how do we get on the wait list to, to, for part two? <laughs> how do we get on your radar? You know, if we're a community or a region or even, you know, a state who's like, we've got water concerns and we want your help. Like what, who do we, who do we, who do we need to talk to? Um, well, you can talk to any of us. Um, uh, I am the associate director for our stakeholder engagement um, for the Internet of Water at CGS. And so um, please, please, please contact me. Um, we are we are open for business, so to speak. Um, we this is, you know, not it's a mission and it's a passion. Um, and we are committed 100 percent, like I said, at all scales. And so um, if there are communities um, out there, states. Um, and, you know, projects that you have in mind, we are open to talking to you about them. So yes, please contact me at least. And if not, you know, any, any of us are really open for a conversation. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, folks, make sure that um, you take a look at the chat box because there are some links in there and now an email address that she might regret putting up here. Um, and also, if you want to join the Water and Planning Network, uh, that email address is, is also up there. Uh, so in closing, thanks to all of you for joining. This was really interesting um, and timely and necessary and all the things. Um, and clearly, we're, we're talking about it right now, like it's happening. Uh, so we thank you for joining us today and for being so passionate about this and doing this work and telling us about it. Um, and don't forget, folks, we're recording this. I'll post it onto our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube and we'll pop up. Uh, don't forget to log those CM credits. They are available. They're up. They're live. They're ready. If you need the event number or the title of today's session to help you find it, head over to our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And that's also where you can find all of our upcoming sessions for you to register for. So uh, thank you to Henry and uh, the Water and Planning Network and all of the partners today who, who brought this together. We appreciate you. And thank and you, folks, Christine. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, this is fun. Uh, so folks, uh, have, a, have a great weekend and we'll talk next time. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.